Hello, bonjour. Uh, C'est Nicole ici, Nicole Anderson Bajeron, avec Business for the Arts. It's wonderful to have you all with us. I see that we still have participants joining us from right across the country. I see your messages coming through. Uh, we're at 848 participants so far, and we expect to reach a thousand. We are also currently live streaming um, for those who are not able to join us um, today as we hit capacity at a thousand. Uh, J'espère que tout le monde va très bien. On est déjà le 1er septembre. Uh, je ne peux pas croire, c'est déjà l'automne. Et uh, avec ça, il y a beaucoup d'anxiété en termes de comment est-ce qu'on va, va gérer ça avec les pandémies uh, encore là. Uh, it's wonderful to have all of you with us. I, before we uh, get started, I, am, uh, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many nations in this country, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work, to live, and to meet on this territory. Now to all of you joining us from right across the country, I'd like to say a warm welcome on behalf of Business for the Arts, but also on behalf of uh, our partners today who we are hosting along with and beside in collaboration with the Canadian Arts Coalition, Mass Culture, and uh, our partners from the very beginning, uh, Global Public Affairs. And uh, we're very pleased to be able to host uh, the first town hall that uh, the minister and his team will be uh, managing um, throughout, throughout the next uh, uh, month or so. And it is a great honor to have the minister with us uh, today with us today. Uh, I'd like to say that um, we are, before we before I introduce our next, next speaker, we have organized this uh, conversation as democratically as possible. We had a survey that many of you responded to, uh, of 100 respondents actually, and we have uh, themes that have been selected that capture as much as possible um, those submissions that you, you sent to us um, that will be, will be discussed uh, to kick things off as part of the town hall. And then we're going to move to a democratic Q&A process where, uh, which will work by vote, um, essentially a polling, um, a poll that we will conduct. And as the conversation ensues, you can submit your questions at the Q&A button that you see right on your screen below. So not the chat function where you're, everyone's saying hello, but right beside that uh, to ensure that we are capturing as many questions as we can uh, you can then vote on the questions that you would like to see most prominently uh, surface as something that the minister uh, is then able to answer. Uh, we'll go through that again uh, for those of you who are still joining and haven't caught uh, those objections. We'll, we'll go through that section again as we move on to that, that uh, portion of today. We only have an hour for this conversation, so uh, with that, I'd like to uh, warmly introduce Charles Smith, who will be um, saying uh, hello on behalf of the Canadian Arts Coalition. So over to you, Charles. Thank you, Nicole, and welcome uh, everyone this afternoon. It's quite an honor to be part of this uh, session this afternoon. Uh, my name is Charles Smith, and as I'm also the Executive Director of Cultural Pluralism Arts Movement Ontario, and a member of the steering committee of the Canadian Arts Coalition. I'm going to pass the baton on to Sean Casey of Global Public. Thank you uh, very much, Charles. Good afternoon, everyone. For those who don't know me, uh, my name is Sean Casey, and I am the Vice President of Cultural Industries at Global Public Affairs. For many of you that do, uh, through our direct work with your organizations or participation in many town halls and forums that we've been part of, welcome to this kickoff ministerial town hall session. Now, of course, Minister Debo is no stranger to these types of forums over the past six months, having participated on a couple of these events hosted by Business for the Arts, the Canadian Arts Coalition. A special thank you to those groups for being part of this event again. From the outset, the minister has indicated he would be fighting for this sector through the pandemic, and he's held true to his word. I'm so very pleased that we are now moving the conversation from one of relief to one of recovery for the arts and culture sector as this is the first of several town halls and roundtables that the minister will be undertaking in September. I just want to acknowledge all of the hard work that goes on behind the scenes to get something like this off the ground. 
I'd like to say thank you to the entire department at Canadian Heritage and to the minister's team, ranging from a true arts champion in Parliamentary Secretary Julie de Bruzen, to your engaged staff, staff, people like Mathieu Bouchard, Rebecca Caldwell, Irene Chung, Maxence Bernier, and Fred Lagrandeur, who are all involved in the sector on a daily basis. Je suis ravi de vous présenter le ministre de Patrimoine canadien et le député de Laurier-Saint-Marie, l'honorable Stephen Guigou. Thank you very much, Sean, for this kind introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Bonjour à, à toutes et à tous. Je suis ravi d'être avec vous et je vous remercie d'être là en si grand nombre. Merci également pour le temps que vous consacrez à cette importante discussion sur les défis auxquels nous faisons face en tant que secteur. Euh, Aujourd'hui, je suis à Montréal sur le territoire traditionnel des Guyag et Haga et je les remercie. Euh, J'aurais beaucoup aimé qu'on puisse se rencontrer en personne, mais l'avantage de faire ça sur Zoom, c'est que tout le monde peut participer d'un bout à l'autre du pays, peu importe où vous êtes maintenant. Et comme Sean l'a indiqué, évidemment, ce travail-là, je ne le fais pas tout seul, je le fais avec une équipe incroyable au ministère du patrimoine, mon équipe ministérielle, Mathieu, Irene, Maxence, Rebecca, Fred, et évidemment, l'excellente Julie de Bruzen, secrétaire parlementaire pour, pour les arts et la culture, qui, qui est une, une championne, elle aussi, pour vous, euh, au, sein de, au sein du Parlement et certainement au sein de, 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 du gouvernement. In, in, in this not-so-normal time, we're all trying to adapt as best as we can. Uh, even so, I know life has gotten much harder for many Canadians, and it's gotten much harder for artists and arts organizations. The pandemic sent shockwaves through many sectors of our economy, but including the performing arts, visual arts, and museum sectors. Your sectors were the first to close, and they will be among the last to reopen. This is making a tough situation even more difficult, uh, both at an economic and emotional level. So many of you have had uh, suddenly to shut down shows that you spend months and months planning. You've had to figure out how to pay the bills with no money coming in. You've had to plan for the future without knowing how long the pandemic will last. And most difficult of us, you've had to lay off people or you yourself have, have lost your job. I know that you're living with the fallout of this crisis and that you will likely feel the effects for a long time to come. I also know that you're working tirelessly to hold your community together. Through all of this, I would say your government has been here for you too, and we will continue to be there. C'est exactement pourquoi je désirais vous rencontrer. Nous avons ici l'occasion de faire le point sur le chemin parcouru et de penser à ce qui s'en vient. Quand je vous ai rencontré en mars dernier, lors de ma première assemblée publique, notre gouvernement avait rapidement mis en œuvre de nombreux programmes qui, encore aujourd'hui, aident des millions de Canadiennes et Canadiens à nourrir leurs familles. Vous nous avez dit ce qui fonctionnait et ce qui ne fonctionnait pas. Our government made, made sure artists could still receive royalties and earn some income without losing access to the CERB, and that is in part thanks to the conversations we've had together. We removed restrictions to the, Canadian, to the Canada Emergency Business Account so that, so that non-for-profit organization could apply. And these changes were only possible because we worked together as a team. Back when we met in March, I said you wouldn't be left to make it on your own, and I meant it. In April, we announced a sector-specific support with the new emergency support fund for the cultural heritage and sports organizations. We set aside nearly 40% of, of the funds for organizations that hadn't received funding from Canadian Heritage before. We made our program more flexible so that smaller organizations like seasonal museums could apply. We also worked closely with the Canada Council for the Arts to ensure that equity-seeking groups received emergency funds. Along with the CERB and the wage subsidy, the Emergency Support Fund is helping to maintain jobs and protect the many organizations across our country that are the beating heart of their communities. I know that you are impatient to return to work. You have found innovative ways in line and in person to be able to do it. Over the last months, I visited several theaters and museums in the region of Quebec, often in company of my children. Entre autres, j'étais à, à l'usine C, le musée de Pointe-à-Calière, le, le Biodôme à Montréal. Euh, en août, j'étais au Théâtre de la Dame de Cœur à Upton, euh, au Musée des Beaux-Arts à Ottawa. Euh, et dans le cas du Musée de, 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 du Théâtre de la Dame de Cœur, euh, un théâtre qui montre des spectacles magnifiques de marionnettes géantes. 
Je sais qu'ils ont repris leur saison avec des spectacles distanciés à l'extérieur. But even though the performing arts, visual arts, and heritage sectors saw some improvements in job numbers this July, employment is still well below pre-pandemic levels. We will need to do more to support the recovery, and we will. But for all of us to recover, we just can't go back to what we had before. Too much has happened. We've all been forced to confront the cracks in our society that we've either ignored for too long or acted on too slowly. We need to envision a future that gives arts organizations more stable sources of revenues and provides a better living for artists, creators, and cultural workers. A future where Canadian art, culture, and stories remain competitive and sought after at home and the world over. A future where Indigenous people, Black people, racialized people, and other equity-seeking communities can see themselves reflected on stage, on screen, and in the boardroom. And a future where we take bold action to protect our planet from climate change, because even when we've solved the COVID issue, the global threat of climate crisis will still be with us. I can think of no better partners for reimagining our future than artists, the visionaries of our society. Dans mes échanges avec votre secteur, et je constate à quel point il y a une réelle volonté de s'engager dans une relance qui ne soit pas tout simplement la même. J'ai entendu vos appels pour faire quelque chose de mieux. Je suis d'accord. On doit aspirer, on doit aspirer à quelque chose de mieux. En tant que militant écologiste, c'est ce que je fais depuis 25 ans. I'm confident we'll come out of today's conversation with a lot of food for thought. Thank you again for joining us today. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Minister, for those wonderful words. Uh, now we're going to move on to the first of two question and answer sections. These are the ones that were the pre-submitted thoughts that the sector had put forward uh, over the last couple of weeks. We've received uh, several hundred recommendations that we are going to uh, look at. Uh, key themes, submitted ideas from all sectors, whether they be performing arts, visual arts, museums and heritage, and individual artists and cultural workers. They're going to revolve around four main areas, continuing emergency support funding, support for operational recovery, ideas to reach audiences and ideas for infrastructure. So to start the conversation off, I will turn it over to Naveed. Oui, bonjour à tous. Uh, C'est uh, Nassi Bersaini des Sept Droits de la Main à Montréal, dans le comté du ministre. Uh, bonjour, uh, Monsieur le ministre. Uh, Permettez-moi d'entrer de jeu uh, de vous uh, ben, remercier pour votre écoute. Vraiment, franchement, uh, on le sent. Uh, on est vraiment, on a beaucoup de gratitude. Aussi pour vous remercier et pour les mesures prises par votre gouvernement et d'être notre ambassadeur. Uh, les répercussions étaient importantes pour notre secteur. Uh, il, fallait, il fallait dire ça pour commencer, pour que ce soit clair. Toute notre gratitude. En fait, pour les mêmes raisons, de, 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 pour les mêmes raisons, il y a une euh, grande anxiété au sujet de la suite. Euh, je ne suis que le porte-parole euh, du sondage qui ramène les questions de la suite en 2021. Euh, en novembre, euh, la, la subvention salariale d'urgence du Canada euh, va baisser à 45 %, de 58 000. Euh, on sait très bien que euh, ce programme-là a été clé pour maintenir en vie euh, la plupart de nos organismes. Et une question qui revient euh, dans le sondage euh, pour vous, c'est comment on envisage la suite pour ce programme tant canadien et tant sectoriel? Euh, comment on va s'y retrouver euh, dans le monde de la culture? Bonjour Nassim, toujours un plaisir de, 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 de se voir, même, même virtuellement. Euh, en fait, je pense que je comprends l'insécurité de, de, de plusieurs face à, à, à la situation. Et ce sont des eaux qui ne sont pas faciles à naviguer pour nous non plus parce que la situation évolue tellement rapidement. Alors, si on prend l'exemple de la subvention salariale, au départ, cette subvention salariale-là, elle était de 10 Nous nous sommes vite rendus compte que ce n'était pas suffisant. Nous l'avons augmentée à 75 
Alors là, au fur et à mesure que les choses reprennent, euh, ce qu'on veut faire, c'est effectivement la, la diminuer, mais, mais la maintenir. Mais si, si on voit que le, cette mesure-là ne fonctionne pas ou, ou ne rencontre pas les objectifs que nous nous sommes fixés en termes, en termes d'appui au secteur, Bien, ce je pense que nous sommes prêts, nous avons démontré, on le fait dans le cas de la prestation canadienne d'urgence, qu'on a prolongé à deux reprises et là, que nous proposons, il faut que ce soit adopté par le Parlement, mais que nous proposons de, pro, de prolonger jusqu'au milieu de, de 2021. Bon, ce ne sera plus la, la prestation canadienne d'urgence comme on la connaît, mais ce sera le, le, le PCU 2.0. Euh, alors, on, on essaie de, de rester très, très à l'affût de comment nos programmes fonctionnent et, et de les ajuster aux besoins lorsqu'ils ne fonctionnent pas suffisamment bien. Euh, vous avez répondu à la deuxième question, donc euh, je n'ai pas à la poser. <rire> Par contre, je vous dis que les collègues qui ont soumis cette deuxième question au sujet de la PCU, vous avez déjà répondu, mais il, il, il aimerait ça vous entendre sur la suggestion d'une revenu de base universelle. Euh, quand, quand je disais tout à l'heure que la, la, la pandémie a, a, a exposé au grand jour des failles assez importantes dans notre système, euh, je, je pense qu'il y a une, une réelle volonté au sein du gouvernement d'avoir une discussion très large et de regarder un ensemble de choses qui, avant la pandémie, étaient inimaginables euh, en termes d'intervention du gouvernement fédéral dans des secteurs comme celui des arts et de la culture, euh, secteur social, euh, la question environnementale. Et alors, je ne suis pas en train de vous dire que demain matin, le gouvernement va annoncer un revenu minimum garanti. Mais ce que je suis en train de vous dire, c'est que nous avons une conversation où pas mal tout est sur la table. Et on, nous allons re regarder. Je, je pense qu'il faut se servir de cette crise que... De, que qui nous est tombé dessus, comme d'un tremplin vers un, vers un meilleur Canada, pour rebâtir, non pas juste refaire ce qui était avant, mais, mais rebâtir mieux euh, sur de meilleures bases. Et, et c'est vrai notamment au niveau des, des programmes sociaux. Alors, il y a beaucoup d'appétit de notre côté pour, pour regarder ce genre de mécanisme-là. Bon, après ça, ce n'est pas simple parce que de façon générale, c'est du ressort des provinces et des territoires, l'aide sociale. Alors, il faudrait... Mais, au-delà de ces, au de ces, de ces questions-là, de ces technicalités-là, nous, on veut, on veut regarder très large et voir bon, qu'est-ce qu'on doit faire. Puis après ça, on verra comment on le fait, puis est-ce qu'il faut faire des négociations avec les provinces. Mais notre objectif, c'est comment bah, rebâtir mieux, à la fois d'un point de vue social, environnemental, et certainement, est, cela est très vrai pour le secteur des arts et de la culture. Bon. Euh, merci beaucoup. La troisième et, et dernière question pour, ce, pour cette section-là, euh, elle, elle, elle est dirigée vers l'aide particulière qui touche le monde de la culture à travers le patrimoine, et donc non pas celle qui touche tous les Canadiens. Et donc, on parle de, euh, de fonds d'urgence relatifs à la COVID. Et une question qui est revenue souvent, est-ce qu'il est qu y a moyen de, de rendre plus euh, ouverts les critères de, de façon à favoriser l'équité entre les organismes soutenus au fonctionnement et ceux soutenus au projet. Et, et aussi, est-ce que c'est possible d'avoir une attention particulière euh, euh, aux organismes qui dépendent grandement de leur revenu autonome? La première chose qu'il faut dire par rapport à ce fonds d'urgence-là, c'est que dans, dans la tête de, 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 de l'équipe et dans les discussions que j'ai eues avec le premier ministre, c'est... C'est clair pour nous que cette aide-là, ce n'est pas, pas la fin de ce qu'on va faire pour le secteur des arts et de la culture. Dans notre esprit, euh, c'est un premier fonds d'urgence pour aider à passer à travers cette première vague-là très brutale pour le secteur. Euh, mais nous sommes bien conscients qu'on va devoir faire plus. Et, et on a essayé... Et peut-être qu'on peut le faire encore plus, mais on, on a vraiment essayé, dans le cadre du fonds d'urgence, de, de faire preuve de, de plus de flexibilité possible. Donc, pour les organisations qui recevaient déjà des fonds de nous, on a dit, écoutez, euh, dépensez l'argent, que le projet ait lieu ou non. 
Donc, utilisez les fonds qui, qui, qui vous étaient déjà octroyés par le Conseil des arts, euh, Téléfilm, euh, Patrimoine canadien, pour, pour, ré, pour ré, éponger une partie de vos, vos pertes. Bon, ensuite, avec l'aide d'urgence, euh, donc je, comme je le disais tout à l'heure, on a réservé 40 pour des organismes qui ne sont pas normalement supportés par le ministère du patrimoine, donc 60 pour les organismes qui le sont. Et là aussi, on a facilité le plus possible les formulaires d'application. Euh, dans le cas des organismes qui, qui recevaient déjà de l'argent, vous n'avez vous eu aucun formulaire à remplir. Euh, vous, vous avez été contacté par le ministère, par le Conseil des arts directement. Et pour ceux qui, qui avaient appliqué, on a essayé de, de faire un formulaire très, très simple, très, très, très facile. Euh, alors, écoutez, si, si vous avez des... des des propositions plus spécifiques sur comment on pourrait faire preuve de plus de flexibilité, s'il vous plaît, faites-nous les parvenir. On va certainement, on va certainement regarder euh, comment, on, comment on peut faire mieux pour, pour, pour la suite des choses. Euh, merci beaucoup. Donc, pour terminer, celle-là, ce n'est pas une question, c'est une proactivité de ma part. Euh, c'est de souhaiter euh, que la culture figure dans le discours du tronc. Puis, euh, c'est un appel aussi à tous mes collègues qui, qui nous écoutent maintenant euh, d'aider notre ministre pour que ça devienne réalité. Et merci beaucoup et, et je passe la parole à mon prochain collègue. Merci, merci. Uh, good afternoon, Minister. I'm Charles Smith again. I'm with the Canadian Arts Coalition and I was very uh, encouraged by your opening comments. Um, the area I want to explore with you is around uh, operational recovery, uh, which is a very key issue that you talked about for artists, arts organizations. And the areas I'd like to explore are around the granting processes itself. Um, they're often complex, as you know, um, require many layers. We have project grants, we have multi-year grants. It seems when you get a project grant, before you know it, you're reporting on it already, uh, and so on. And this has become a rather onerous burden to many arts organizations, particularly to newer arts organizations, arts organizations that come from indigenous and equity seeking communities. The other area I want to explore is how can other benefits be provided to the arts through tax incentives, for example, or other amendments um, to the broadcasting, telecommunications and copyright acts that would um, provide more support to artists and arts organizations on the ground. So maybe let's break it up into two areas. What thoughts are there on streamlining the grant application process, which would inevitably reduce administrative burden on the part of the arts councils, but more particularly reduce the administrative burden on arts organizations? And I'm thinking here particularly of small arts organizations, emerging arts organizations. Thank you, Charles, for, for these questions. So the first one, um, I hear you. I, as someone who's worked for, for community organization for, for 25 years, I, I have filled in uh, federal government grant application, not in the arts and culture sector, but I mean, we, know, we know what they are. Uh, they're very complex. And, and to some extent, I mean, we're, we're starting to realize that they are basically, they, they've become by default sort of a, uh, an entry barrier to smaller organization, more marginalized organization. I mean, when we talk about systemic racism, this is one clear example of what systemic racism can look like. No one got up one morning and said, we're going to make these things so complex that these organizations won't be able to, to apply. But, but by default, this is, this, is, this is what's happening. So there is a, a real willingness on, on a part of my team and, and, the, and the department. We have started talking about this. We want to review um, all of our programs. Now, we, this one. This is something we had started working on pre-pandemic. It's not something we will we will achieve overnight. Um, um, uh, Program-based funding uh, versus operations. I think we need to change that too. Uh, there. I don't know what happened. I don't know when at the federal government because it's same is true on the environment sector of things. Like. Once upon a time, they used to support or organizations' missions, and and then every everything went to program-based uh, funding. And I think you know there there's merits to having program-based funding, but I don't think it should all be program-based funding for 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 the exact reasons that what some of some of them you were mentioning. And I think we need to find a better balance. So I don't think it should all be mission-based either. Uh, but I think that there needs to be a better mix. And we've erred on, uh, on the side of 
almost only uh, project based. And I, to me, um, as as an activist, as uh, uh, and as your representative uh, 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 at the government, this this needs to change. Um, and we have started working on that, and we will. As normal activities, uh, as far as government, as far as government operations are concerned, we this is a, a piece of work we will be um, accelerating uh, over the coming months. So, will that look at um, perhaps providing more multi-year funding, which could still be project-based, not mandate-based, mm -hmm. um, but certainly take that onerous uh, burden off of both applicants and off of arts councils? We we want to look at a, at a number of things. So I can't I, I I can't I mean yes we would be looking at that. Am I saying that in the newer version of our programs you know it, it's all going to be multi year? Probably not. But but definitely this is something that this is one of the elements that would be looked at. Okay. Excellent. Uh, uh, just just one one point on you know on funding we need to find a balance um, where. We we fund existing organizations, but we also have a have some mechanisms for new organization to come into to, to the system. When I looked at most of the programs at Heritage, uh, many of those were established a long time ago, and 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 all of the money has been attributed, or most of the money is attributed to organizations that have been around for a long for a long time ago. So when New emerging, uh, often um, indigenous or, or racialized, uh, racialized organizations, try to come into the system. There's no, there's no space anymore. And I mean, in an ideal world, uh, funding for arts and culture would go up every year. <laughs> I, I, I am going to advocate for that, but I, chances are I won't always be successful. So we need to, to find a way where we can support those that are there, but also leave space for 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 for, for new talents, new organization to to come in. And and to give you an example of uh, how, um, in terms of flexibility, I mean, we're even for this is more specific to indigenous organizations, but in really remote community communities where there's limited access to internet, and even the traditional mail. So we've started taking uh, oral uh, applications, calling people and, 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 and getting their applications over the phone to, to facilitate that, that process for some organization. Obviously, if you're in downtown Montreal, Toronto, you'll have to fill in an application form, but, but for some, it needs to be easier. You've segued into my uh, other area, which is around um, your, how, uh, you're thinking of prioritizing indigenous, racialized, or the marginalized groups. Um, this has been a call that has been out for quite some time, uh, and some are feeling that, you know, as the paper that my organization put out, achieving equity or waiting for Godot. Um, so what are the plans, if any, at this time to really prioritize these arts organizations and these artists? I think, I mean, it it must be about many things um as i was saying in my in my notes earlier you know it, those people need to see themselves uh, on screen on stage and in the boardroom so i i we it's it's somewhat um extremely optimistic to keep having the same people on our decision making bodies uh i e white people usually men over 50s um to keep nominating the same type of people and hoping that somehow the things are going to change. So we need to change the way we change the representation that that we put at the at the head of our of our organization on on boards. Um, and this is something we've started doing. I mean, since the government came in in 2015. Um, the diversity, so uh, underrepresented um, Canadians from underrepresented community, racialized communities, First Nations, LGBTQ+, they've gone, the, those nominations coming from those communities have gone up 50%. Um, I mean, Jesse Wente as head of the Canada Council, uh, Aisha, Aisha Khan as uh, head of the, the Canadian Human Rights Museum. So, that's one one component, but the second component is we have to put our money where our mouth is. 
so there needs to be, and, and, and we are starting to, to, to see that in, in some cases, and I know we need to do so much more, but dedicated um, dedicated funding streams for, for, for these particular communities, because because otherwise, uh, you know, we can't. I, again, you know, they if, if you're a tr if you're from a marginalized community and you're trying to compete with a well-established organization that's been around for 20 years that has access to all sorts of uh, sources of funding, there's no way you can compete. So we need we 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 need to do that. It's a priority for for me for the team. It's a priority for the prime minister and our government as well. My final area is around uh, incentives that can come from other areas, such as from philanthropy, whether or not tax breaks might be given to philanthropic organizations to support the arts. And also, as I mentioned earlier, what marketplace solutions can there, can there be um, in the works um, through amendments to the Broadcasting, Telecommunications and Copyright Acts? Um, in terms of incentive, we will be looking at a whole range of possibilities, including uh, including the, the tax system, uh, certainly, and, and are there further incentives that, that could be provided on, on, on that side of things? Um, one thing that I want to do very early on when the, when the House come, comes back is to table a bill on, um, on, on reform and reviewing the, the Broadcasting Act um, to do a couple of different things, but the, the biggest thing I want to do with this bill is ensure that the web giants pay their fair share in terms of Canadian cultural content and the discoverability of that content. And they're not right now. Um, and there's a high level of support around uh, through our, our, our government for for, for that, um, so we would we would be we would be ensuring that we have the tools uh, required in Canada to, to to ensure that this this happens. And if we do it well, we anticipate that it, it hundreds of millions of more dollars would be invested in in Canada in in Canadian cultural content with a specific uh, attention being paid to uh, indigenous production, uh, racialized communities, underrepresented uh, communities, um, equity seeking seeking groups. So this is coming uh, your way and um, in, in, in the coming months and I will need your help. Um, I mean, you're seeing what's happening around the world where countries are trying to ask some of these web giants to do their fair share. Look at what's happening right now in Australia uh, with, with Facebook. There's a big pushback. So we will need people to, to not shy to say publicly, this is the right thing to do. You don't have to say you like us or you know, you're going to vote for us, but we need you, we need Canadians to hear that they that for many other Canadians that they think this is the right thing to do. Thank you. I'm gonna move you on to the next uh, question. Hello, uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, je m'appelle Alissa Palmer et comme Nassib avant moi, je, je suis aussi dans le comité de ministres ici à Montréal, dans les territoires de Kanyagahaga. Je suis la directrice artistique de section anglophone à l'École nationale de, de théâtre. Uh, et comme directrice de section anglophone, je vais maintenant parler en anglais. Uh, <laughs> um, hello, um, Minister. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Um, the questions that I'm... Um, that I'm responsible for from the survey uh, have to deal with um, ingredients that we hope to see in your in the recovery plan. Um, every arts organization has uh, a number of different strategies to reckon with reopening and finding our audiences, finding our communities again, um, and and redeveloping the connection and creating new connections with our audiences since uh, COVID. Um, and we're interested in hearing how some of these um, approaches can be supported and implemented in the recovery plan. The first question is um, helping to uh, helping organizations to reopen um, by providing a subsidy for lower than expected revenues. Um, for example, in order to deal with uh, social distancing, our audiences or our participating communities are going to be um, a lot smaller in number. Um, is there an approach to subsidizing and compensating financially for those losses? Certainly something we're looking at. What exact mechanism um, will we try and put forward um, 
I don't know yet, but but definitely we we understand the challenges for for so many of of your organizations um, with with on, on this particular topic. Um, there is a so there's a conversation happening. We've been approached by by many organizations. The Quebec government has a has a proposal as a proposal. They're 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 floating around. Um, so we're, we're we're definitely looking at uh, how we could what would be the best mechanism or if not the best you know a good mechanism to 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 help to help compensate for for those losses that's wonderful um uh there for those who are um doing digital programming are there um, plans to provide financial assistance for the transition to digital programming um digital equipment creation production costs marketing costs artist fees all it's a whole new world that we've had to um uh, embrace and it's led to a lot of creative discoveries and it's also been um uh, onerous obviously for for many of us who are working uh, and extending ourselves beyond um what we ever expected to be doing uh, do you see how that could be supported financially in new programs or as part of the recovery plan that you're overseeing? Well, I mean, we already have um, money available as part of our actual programming to, to do that. I think the question is, is that sufficient? Is that is that enough? And I'm of the opinion that we could do more. Um, now, this is clearly a conversation that needs to happen with the new finance minister. Uh, and there will be... Um, We'll, we'll have a budget coming at, at some point. Uh, and this is this is one of the areas. I mean, I think I'm not of the opinion, like many of you, I, I imagine, that, you know, everything's going to go online now. Um, but but for, for those organizations who see this as an avenue, as a, as a, as a new stream, uh, and, and who want to, to do more than what they, they did or start doing it if they didn't do it before, I think we need to... We need to be there to to help them uh, do that, and and as I said, we have some some money for for that uh, at Heritage, but I think I, I think it could be beefed up. Um, now, on that as as well as on many other things, I have my my work cut out. <laughs> yes, because both my points you've kind of said yes to financial support. I think it's wonderful getting exactly the answers that we would probably all appreciate hearing. I'm not, I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> just to, to be clear on every, with everybody, I'm not saying it's a done deal, but, but we are, you know, I, I mean, we can't, we can't have social distancing measures um, with which I agree uh, that say that we can't have more than you, you can't have in your, in your concert halls, more than forty or maybe fifty percent of the normal um, normal crowd that would be there, and you know, just cross our fingers and every, hope that everything's going to be fine. Like it's yeah. so we we need we need to find a way to to support you on, until you can get back to normal levels. And so I, I yeah. we need to do that. I think that's. I think it's 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 really um, invaluable to create a dial a, a, a dynamic where we're trying to protect the safety of our artists and our communities and our audiences and our participants, and being supported to do that, so yep. that there is no imperative to uh, put anyone in a yep. high risk situation. Um, and speaking of that, and, and I, I hear what you're saying about everything not going online. I think that's. You know, ideally, we have something that comes out of this process where we all take advantage of the creative discoveries, but we also recognize that it's it's vital to have our audiences come together, our communities, people being live in spaces together, in whatever our artistic form we're talking about. So the final question that I have is, do you see um, how uh, supporting the development and outreach to audiences and communities can be financially part of the recovery plan. And that includes, you know, marketing costs, um, tourism support, touring support. Um, there'll be a very different uh, discourse needed with our audiences to reassure them that it's safe to come back and also to remind them that, um, you know, binging on Netflix was really fun, but there's, uh, there's a world out there that, that we that we we have to come back to or 
that we want to re-engage with in this in this new uh, COVID post COVID world. Clear to us that there's a you know, there's a very direct link between um, how the arts and culture self sector does in terms of the recovery and how other sectors do, like tourism, for example. So we, I am talking, uh, and we are talking with um, my colleague Melanie, Melanie Jolie and, uh, and, and her team, uh, Economic Development and, and Tourism, to see how, how we can work together. And I mean, Melanie being the previous Heritage Minister, certainly one of the biggest ally I have around, around the cabinet table. I have many, but Mel is certainly a, certainly a big one. Um, so we are looking at what can be the synergies between what what we are trying to do in the arts and culture on one side and what 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 could be done in other sectors that would be beneficial for these sectors, but certainly for for ours and vice versa. You know what what's good for for arts and culture would probably be good for for tourism and hospitality sector and and, and restaurants as well. Yeah. So um, this is clearly a, a part of the thinking and. and going into the that the, the, the recovery phase, which we're not quite there yet. No, no, but we're planning ahead. Yes. Um, there's also, uh, and, I, and I'm, I no doubt you're aware of this, but there are, are, are a number of hidden costs that happen, you know, artists and arts administrators and behind the scenes people we, we have, um, uh, and you would know as, a, as an activist as well, there's this uh, tendency to go above and beyond the call of duty. Oh. And... So many of us are adapting and working from home and working remotely and just um, just making it work. And um, I think there's sort of um, I just wanted to sort of put on the table. I don't know how those those um, that kind of labor is compensated for or how I just feel like it's something that's worth noting because it can become invisible as we kind of get our footing under us that it's uh, it's sort of on the table as something that um, is something that we in the art sector are absorbing all the time along yeah. with other sectors and that I hope that that has a place in people's um, in minds as we're as you're making recovery plans. Well, if you have I, I, I may have said that earlier, but if you have specific ideas or suggestions or, or proposal, um, please send them our way because we uh, we are looking. That is a great invitation, and I, I hope I'm sure everybody heard that <laughs> invitation. So, <laughs> thank you so much for your commentaries, and it was a, a real uh, pleasure and honor to speak with you. Oh, thank you. And I'll hand it over to the next speaker now. Thank you very much. Uh, good to have the opportunity to speak with you again, Minister. Uh, just for those who are looking to add some questions to the Minister in the Q&A section, I've seen a lot of questions in the chat. Please uh, transfer them over to the Q&A. We're going to be moving to that that section very, very quickly. just wanted to touch on the topic of infrastructure. I'm going to combine a couple of topics together here in the, uh, the fullness of time to allow some of those uh, other questions from the floor to get answered. Um, again, the traditional uh, infrastructure programs uh, that could be accessed by museums, for example, for the bricks and mortar. Uh, again, some of your thoughts regarding uh, where those programs may be headed. Are there additional investments? But also for investments that uh, in infrastructure that are a little bit more non-traditional. I think of uh, at the beginning of the year, there are probably not many organizations that had line items for PPE, plexiglass, or contact tracing programs. So related to health infrastructure, uh, where there might be additional funding there. And also, although the government and the provincial government have partnered quite well together in uh, providing various levels of rent relief, there is a strong push from the sector for either zero or low rent cost spaces available for organizations to use. So I know I've sent you off down three different paths on infrastructure. Uh, I'll let you wrap them all together. Um, so the more traditional infrastructure um, part of your question first. Um, I, I mean, there is already, I mean, so clear the ministry has a program for that uh, and for larger projects, then we have to, to go to the uh, federal, provincial, territorial agreements. Um, but in the case of, um, I don't have all the numbers in front of me, but certainly for, for Quebec and Ontario, for example, um, there's a lot of money available uh, as part of those agreements, like 
tens of millions of dollars that um, federal government is just waiting for provinces to to tell us, okay, well, this is you know we want to fund that project and this project and that other project, and and maybe now is a good time to do that. I mean, if if you can't welcome people or or not too many people, maybe now's a it's a good time. So if what I've been telling organizations that have been that I've been meeting, I mean, if you were planning to 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 do renovations two years from now, any chance you can do it in the next six to eight months or and and there is funding uh, and there's quite a bit of funding available for that in terms of the non-traditional uh in well, infrastructure uh, health um not something i i had come across uh, so far but certainly something um we we will take note of and what was your third point sean uh, it was regarding our low rent costs or uh, okay, yeah. free rent space for various arts organizations. Rent is a bit, I mean, it's more tricky for us as a federal government because we, uh, unless we start buying property in, uh, around the country, like it's, uh, it's complicated. And we have saw with the, the rent assistant program, it wasn't easy, needed to work with, I'm not saying it wasn't easy because we needed to work with province, but it was a, a complicated program to, to deploy um, and a less successful one than, 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 than many of our others because of that level of, of complex uh, complexity. Um, so tougher not, tougher not to crack for, for, for us this one, clearly. Like I just wanna be honest. Uh, with, with you. Absolutely. Uh, again, I want to thank you, Minister, for your time on all of these questions that came pre-sent uh, in uh, as part of the, uh, the session. Now we're going to go to the uh, thousand or so people that are part of the uh, town hall session. Uh, there are a lot of questions. Again, um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Monica Akala from Business for the Arts, uh, who is going to take us through how we're going to determine the live questions and start asking of you, of, them, of you, Minister. Thank you. Sean, uh, hi, Minister, nice to speak with you. Hi. And to everyone watching, um, our first two questions dovetail into one another quite nicely, so I'd encourage you to vote for other ones further down that way. Okay, so our first question is, the effect of the new rules around the extension of the CEWS will be devastating on our company and the arts. Due to the ongoing declining CEWS subsidy over the period of August 30th to November 21st, we will have no choice but to lay off most of our staff. Is there any discussion around an art sector specific CEWS extension to keep our employees off EI and to help us rebuild quickly? As I said earlier to, I think it was in an answer to a question from Nassib, um, we, we are trying to adapt our programs to ensure that they are that they are successful, that they are achieving the objectives they're designed to. So if if people if people have have challenges, difficulties, or or are seeing that they will be that they will be facing problems because of the the way we've we've designed some of some of the programs, um, please please let us know, and 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 I will certainly talk to my colleagues and see how we could adapt. Uh, these better is, is there is there a discussion about an uh, arts and culture specific? I mean, we've we've tried to steer away from from sector specific um, just because it, it becomes so complex and it takes you know putting together these programs takes time and we're in a, mi a minority situation in parliament getting them getting the other parties to to vote on it's it's a comp it's a, the 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 mechanics of it are, are pretty complex. So we are trying to have programs that are flexible enough to embrace different realities of different sectors. Um, but if you feel that, you know, the changes that we've made don't work for you, let us know. And I will, um, I will certainly, we will look at it and I will certainly talk to my, to my cabin colleagues to see. Uh, and we, as I said earlier, we have adjusted these programs many times in, in, in the last six months to, to make them, um, to make them relevant to, to, to as many of your organization and, and, and in many cases, personal situations as possible. Okay, thank you. So our, 
After our next question, I'm going to toss it to Nassib to ask our first French question. But the next question I'm going to ask is from Frédéric Julien. And it's the sustainability of the entire live performance sector is heavily dependent upon ad admissions revenues. These are generated by performing arts organizations and by multidisciplinary presenting organizations and festivals. What are the government's intentions for extending funding via Canada Arts Presentation Fund and building communities through arts and heritage, which is set to end in March 2021? The, clearly some, I mean, I, I think uh, I had a similar questions, question earlier on. Um, it's clearly something we're, we're looking at. When I said that we we have supported the sector through that first phase of the, of the pandemic and we will continue. So we are trying to look at what better, best ways or good ways to, to do that. So is it specifically these programs or would it something, would it be something a bit different? But we understand uh, that, that we will need to continue supporting, I mean, especially uh, the li live performing arts. There's, there's no way you guys will make it unless, um, uh, I mean, you know, it's the somewhat ironic that we over the years have asked you guys to be less dependent on government funding. So you've gone through ticketing or a partnership with private sectors or a whole range of different things. And now because, because of what happened, everything dried up except government funding. So we can't, you know, the fact that many of you were successful at, at being less dependent on, on government shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't be a reason you're being penalized. Um, because of your success. And I'm very, and my team and I are very mindful of that. Uh, and the prime minister is as well. So I, I can't tell you what the mechanism or mechanisms will be, but but we we are working uh, to, to, to make sure that that we are there to, to, to continue supporting you. Je pense que c'est à moi de de prendre la question d'une collègue qui demande concernant les festivals déjà soutenus, pourrions-nous espérer recevoir des versements accélérés avant le mois de décembre en vue des éditions 2021? Et ce, même si ces festivals sont en cours de renouvellement d'entente. Difficile un peu pour moi de, de, de discuter de, de, de cas spécifiques sur, un, sur un, une conversation comme celle-là, mais le, le mot d'ordre au ministère, c'est comment on peut aller le plus rapidement possible. Est-ce qu'il y a des programmes euh, qui sont des programmes déjà prévus au ministère dont on peut accélérer le déploiement euh, au cours des, 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 des prochaines semaines, des, des, des prochains mois? On a commencé à le faire avec certains programmes. Il y a un enjeu de capacité, évidemment, au, au ministère, puis le fait que... Euh, avec le, le, le télétravail, il y a un certain nombre de choses qui, qui ont ralenti un peu au ministère, mais, mais on veut essayer, l'engagement que je prends avec vous, c'est de faire tout ce qui est possible et de travailler avec l'équipe euh, au patrimoine pour faire tout ce qui est possible pour, oui, accélérer le déploiement des programmes le plus rapidement possible compte tenu de, compte tenu de la situation. Thank you. Our next question, um, after this one, I'll have Elisa ask our second French question. And this question is from Scott Dermody, and it is, the news of CERB transitioning into an enhanced EI program is welcome. However, will the federal government seriously explore a universal basic income? Those in the performing arts living with precarity as a matter of course would greatly benefit from UBI, as would countless others. I, I touched on that earlier on. Um, so, so we're we're coming up with a a way more flexible flexible EI system, uh, but we've also announced the 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 the, the kind of the CERB 2.0, the Canadian Recovery Benefit the CRB, um, which uh, still has to be voted on in, in in the House of Commons. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get the necessary vote to get it through. Um, if you do talk to people from uh, other political parties at the House of Commons, you should, uh, if you like this idea, you, you should tell them. Um, but it would provide it would provide assistance until the middle of 2021. 
Um, and as I was saying earlier, um, I think, again, in an answer to one of the first questions from Nassib, um, the, conver the conversation of, of um, taking a, a long, hard look at our social programs in Canada is a very live conversation. Um, and, and there's a and it's a very open conversation that that we're having. So I I haven't heard anyone say, oh well, no, this is this is something we won't do. We're not going there. We're, we're discard we won't even look at this. This is not happening. We're looking at a whole range of things. Would it be specifically uh, universal basic income? Would it be a variation? Um, I, I don't know yet, but uh, but I what I can tell you is that the conversation is happening. Sorry, and Elisa, if you're still on, are you able to ask that second French question? Est-ce que c'est anonymous attendi? Attendi? From Daniel Duro. Malheureusement, je ne le vois pas sur euh, Daniel de Rollet, c'est ça? Yeah, Pour yeah. Les, oui, oui, oui. Pour les organisations qui ont été en mesure de proposer une programmation ou qui le désirent, les jauges avoisinant les 25 de la capacité habituelle, est-ce qu'on envisage, envisageable qu'une mesure d'appareillement de la billetterie puisse être mise en place? Mais C'est à peu près euh, la question ouais, que, que vous avez posée tout à l'heure. Oui. oui, oui, oui. Alors, euh, euh, peut-être une autre, euh, une autre question. Allez-y. Euh, ah, OK, il y a une de Louis Doucet. Euh, Avez-vous envisagé une aide pour la jeunesse qui sera grandement isolée en milieu scolaire des en, interventions artistiques et culturelles? Euh, non, euh, non. Euh, ben, évidemment, l'éducation est de domaine de, de juridiction provinciale et, et territoriale, mais j'ai une amie qui est professeure d'art dans, un, dans une école secondaire. Évidemment, c'est très complexe présentement. Mais je ne suis pas certain que c'est le genre de choses que nous pourrions faire, même si on voulait le faire. Oui, merci. Monica, euh, est-ce qu'on est qu veut que je cherche, Nassib et moi, je cherche des questions en français ou en, en change? Or should we switch to uh, an English question? Um, we can, but I want to be cognizant of the time because we're at 4 p.m. If the minister has time for one more, I could ask that. But um, I just wanted to be. Let, let's do one for the road. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Okay. So the next question is from Wesley Colford, and it's right now the Canadian emergency wage sub subsidy is the only reason we're able to commit to employing our staff. With this program phasing down through the next four months, we have grave doubts about whether we can retain our staff in January or even December. Is there any discussion about having this amazing program being extended for the sectors that have been hit the hardest? As I said earlier, there is an ongoing conversation within the government to ensure that we are helping those that need help um, and, and that we can continue doing that. So is that happening and are we evaluating um, the impacts or anticipated impacts of, uh, of our new programs, absolutely. And as I, I offered it earlier, I'll, I'll say it again, you know, if, if you can, if, if you think that for a reason or another, the pro, that program or another program we would have put forward won't work for you, let us know. And, and please provide us with as much information as possible. This helps us in turn talk to colleagues and, and make the case for why, you know, it should be this way instead of that way. Okay, thank you, Minister. And I'm going to hand it over to Robert. Uh, thank you, Monica. Um, first of all, let me say, um, as Chair of Business for the Arts, uh, and on behalf of our partners, Canadian uh, Arts Coalition and Global Public Affairs, uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. You know, Minister, listening to you, three words came to mind. Aware, 
sensitive and responsive. And let me just explain. Clearly from your comments, uh, you are well aware of the issues we face uh, as a sector. Um, you are sensitive to those issues. And I think a lot of that probably comes from the fact uh, you've had significant personal experience in the not-for-profit sector, and uh, you've carried that with you, uh, given your current responsibilities to our great uh, appreciation. And in addition, you are responsive to our needs, our concerns, and you're carrying that forward uh, to the cabinet table. So it gives us a great hope that we have you as our champion, and we thank you very much for uh, the way you are carrying our burden and sharing it with us. Um, in addition, you uh, indicated uh, sensitivity to diversity uh, issues uh, with which we are all dealing, uh, and we need your support and we appreciate it greatly. Uh, finally, in conclusion, uh, let me thank our panelists, our partners, and all of you for joining us. Goodbye. Thanks, Rep. And uh, we'll stay on for 10 more minutes for technical reasons, but with uh, a, a non participation by any of us. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you very much, Robert. Bye, Minister. Thank you.